Welcome back. At this point, uh, we only have three more classes. What's that? There we go. Uh, today, we're going to finish up ion channels, which are membrane-bound proteins that are involved in communication from the outside world, extracellular, to the inside world. And they, in general, depend on the voltage between the outside and the inside, and that's what we spend most of our time. There are also can be dependent on ligand, the presence of ligand in, indicates that the ion channel should open or closed. And these are largely involved in uh, the nerves associated with your central nervous system. And they're also mechanically sensitive. They rely on batteries, that is, there's a constant source across the membrane, and then they use this source to open or close and allows current to flow. And in fact, this is what we will talk about towards the end of today's lecture. How is it that you generate a source of constant voltage? And then the answer is you have sodium and potassium exchange, such that you use up a little bit of ATP to either pump sodium, you have, let's say, equal amounts in the inside and the outside, that's sort of what you have normally. And if you want more sodium on the inside or on the outside, you have to do some energy. So you take the energy from ATP, and for each ATP, you transport a certain number of sodiums, in this case, outside. Also, at the same time, you transport a certain number of potassium inside. Okay, and then in terms of the on-off switch, it turns out, and you saw this last time, that they tend to be like transistors. They're either on or they're off. There's no in-between. Though the, the sum of all of these digital ones ends up being in an ensemble form. You can be partially open or partially closed in general. And in fact, there are really fantastic analogs between humans and, I don't know, between humans, this person has a mutation in the potassium channel, which, as you can see, makes her leg shake, shake and then Similarly, what is probably the best known mutation in the potassium channel is called the shaker potassium channel because you give fruit flies some ether. When they come back, they end up shaking their legs. Okay, by the way, all of this is hopefully a review. Um, and if it's not a review, wake up. So the membrane proteins over here basically have a hole in them. The pore the hole is formed by generally a tetramer, one, two, three, four, 
<laughs> and the hole is right in the center. And the hole, which is either sort of capped or non-capped, is such that at first it's sensitive to sodium, and then the sodium starts to shut off, and the potassium comes on. Now one, did you have, no? now, now one question about this that was raised at the end of last lecture is we're talking about positive ions here, right? Sodium is plus and K plus. And so why is it that here it goes towards positive potential and here it goes towards negative potential? And that's it. But yet you're, only, you're still having positive ions flowing. Talk about it and get back to me in a minute. Okay. Is it clear? Huh? Yeah, we're still talking about it. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Sure. We're a little bit confused on the questions. Oh, okay. The, the question is, how can you have the, these positive, positive ions flowing, either in or out or something like that, but yet you're talking about it resulting in a positive potential or a negative potential, right? So how, how does that work? So what, what does a positive potential mean? Okay. So, question is, what does a positive potential and a negative potential mean? And how do you get that from simple, simply positive ions flowing? <coughs> Talking about sodium and potassium. Okay, who, who can help me out here? Yes. How about loud? Oh, okay, tell you what. Come on up here. Bet, bet, bet you didn't realize this, huh? Wait, wait, let's see if I... Oh, I do have something. <laughs> so a uh, potential is like one thing relative to another. And so... This resting potential is the inside uh, voltage potential relative to the outside one. And so when it's at negative 60, 70, uh, the inside voltage is 70 less than the outside one. But when you let in the sodium ions, uh, you're bringing in positive charge, so the inside voltage is higher relative to the outside. And then when you let out the potassium, you're letting out positive ions, so this voltage then increases again. How do you do? What? But only a few people gave him a thumbs up. I realize, you know, it is early in the morning after Thanksgiving break. But how many people, if I called you right now and I wanted you to repeat what he just said, that you'd feel comfortable doing that. 
Uh, yeah, oh, okay. I, I'm interested in the people who haven't raised their hand. Come on. What, uh, ask some questions about, about what he just said. No? You guys are wimps. So, uh, ah. <laughs> yeah, so uh, do you think yeah, Okay. You guys are all wimps except for him. <laughs> Go ahead. So uh, do you think uh, the chemical protection is also playing a role, or is it just electrical gradient? I think it's just a much. Well, okay. So in, now, in the, just the voltage. Uh, yeah. What? Like, does it play a role in changing it, or just in yeah, creating so, it? Sodium is being now it's sodium is transferring, and then potassium is transferring, and vice versa. Mm -hmm. So in both the transfer, is it just the electrical gradient? Or oh, um, it it's probably a combination of both oh. uh, that changes it. Well, what is the chemical potential versus the electrical potential? What? Okay, this is a bit going beyond. So let's thank him for doing a kick-ass job. <laughs> hold on, hold on. There you go. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead. So is it um, electric potential where you're just looking at like the charges on each side and determining which way electrons are going to flow uh, through the gate or whatever? Or is chemical potential is looking at the relative concentrations of the ions and that's also going to want to go towards equilibrium? It, exactly. So the things are going to ex ex what you said. So it, in this case, uh, S sodium, for example, has a real high, high over here and low over here. So chemically, it will want, want to go. Also, electrically, if it's at zero and minus one, minus point one, electrically, it will want to go. On the other hand, what about, what about potassium? Initially, it's high potassium here. So if you open it up, what is going to want to happen? Chemically, it wants to go, but electrically, at this point, it doesn't. It doesn't want to go because, you know, you're at negative potential. Although, you know, when it's over here, if it, if it was opening, it would want to go. So it's a combination of electrical and, and chemical. Yes? So, uh, for the electrical grade, gradient, so the driving force is the voltage. Yeah, that's right. So we have, at, one, at two points, we have zero volts, like, dip, like yeah. over there. It's a little bit higher, like minus 20 and zero volts. No, not here, but yeah, here. A little bit higher, at zero volts. <laughs> okay. So when you have wait, zero, wait, What about over there? That's like zero point one. Oh, okay. So if you have zero volts, like the dif like difference in potential, mm -hmm. so does it does the charge want to like flow around or they stay at this? Like, you you, t you tell me. The like, the voltage is is a, all of. Well, go ahead. So I'm mean, like, it's not all about the voltage. Well, the voltage is is a, a certain it, one aspect of it. It's a combination of electrical, namely the voltage, and the chemical. That's right. So even when there's zero potential, nothing dri driving it, there may be, in fact, a chemical potential, <coughs> which dr does drive it. OK? OK. And. What I expect you to do is tell about exactly what is happening at each of the points over here, and to, to tell about why it, you get a voltage pulse as opposed to just a voltage spread. And the answer has to do, what, why? T tell me again 
why you get uh, a voltage, you get a voltage pulse as opposed to, you know, a voltage just sort of spreading. Channels become inactive. The channels become inactive. So at first, this guy goes, and which causes this guy to go, some positive ions, positive ions, which then tend to open this, which then tend to open this. But during that time, this guy will, the sodium will shut off. OK? So I want you to do this. and. To understand what the so why the sodium is flowing in based on both the electrical and the chemical potentials. And then the sodium or potassium channel, as we just said, tends to shut off at a, after a certain period of time. That's independent of the voltage. And the way they do it is because they have a ball and chain at the end here. In general, the ball does not fit in over here. You get some depolarization. It allows ions to flow, but at the same time, it opens up at the end here where this is diffusing around and then can go and occlude the channel. In terms of answering whether there are, there are digital or analog, what we did is we managed to isolate a single channel over here, which is really an amazing accomplishment because you basically just have simple V equals IR. And if R is really big, I can be really small, but you can get a sizable voltage out of it. And that's, in fact, what they did. And they found that in fact, it, when they looked at single ion channels, that they were always digital. And the amount of time varied. And you add up a bunch of them, you get this. What, what, what is going on here? You guys know, already know the answer to this. The, this guy seems to be open a fair amount of time, and then closes. This guy seems to be open only a short amount of time, and then closes. What, what's, what's the difference between this channel and that channel? Yes? Okay, that 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 what you said is very good. However, it actually doesn't apply in this particular case because you're only looking at a single ion channel. That, that's one of the things about this. It's, it's beautiful. This is an ion channel, and this is an ion, either completely separate, or maybe this is an ion channel that opens digitally and then closes, and then you do it again. So it's actually the same channel. But this time, it only opens for a real little bit. So it's not that it's a matter of different ion channels. 
the, the same ion channel can be. So why? Yes. Is it like um, a result of like the split passive nature of the ball opening and closing? And, and why is it you say it's the stochastic nature of the ball and chain? What what does that mean? Well, so the ball is just like kind of moving around like Brownian like, I guess. And then whether or not it like opens or closes kind of like at the will of the environment. Uh, exactly correct. And it's independent of vo voltage. Or it, it just happens, it goes, and it's randomly moving on its chain, and then opens, and then randomly goes and, and occludes the channel. In this case, it took a while. In this case, it, it took less time. In fact, you could calculate this if you want to. You know maybe the size of the, the ball, so you can calculate what its diffusion constant. If you know the diffusion constant, then x squared equal 4dt, and you can say, okay, the chain is a certain length, and so in that, that case, it has to go, you know, x number of nanometers or something like that. Yes? I was going to ask, for the third channel, it looks like it's opening and closing like pretty rapidly for the first two. Is that just like really, really quick depolarization right after it closes back up? Or? Yeah, I don't know. It, it, it looks like it's open, and then it closes, but then it, it opens. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Okay. Okay, now the, the question is, so there is some gate associated with turning on and turning off. What is that gate? And that we know that this gate is a function of the voltage. Why? Why do we know that? How is it a function of the voltage? Let's say, let's say uh, you know, you have these four protein subunits, and let's say they were, imagine that they were consisted of all neutral charges. Would it know what the voltage is across the membrane? No. Therefore, there must be some charges because the, the, and the, the, the energetics are such that the charge times the voltage. So in one case, it's like this. In the other case, it's like this. So E equals zero and E equals minus Q times V being V being the minus 0.1 volts or minus 0.06, whatever. And so you can go through and look to see where there are charges. And if you look at this one protein, you find that, in fact, it has six transmembrane <coughs> regions. In this region, that is within the, the membrane, it tends to be hydrophobic, the amino acids, which is the usual thing for a membrane protein to have. But in fact, you find that there is one called S4, which is unusual in that it has some positive charges. Oh, positive charges times some voltage gives you an energy difference. So you can imagine, it, it, let's say this is zero minus 
0.1. So when it's closed, it is down like this, and then when it's zero, it, it tends to have a spring which brings it back over there. And in fact, that's exactly correct, that S4 tends to be the voltage sensor. It turns out that S2 has a little bit of the voltage sensor, it has some plus charges also, yes? Ah, okay, thank you. Uh, th these, the number, this is uh, amino acid 346, this is amino acid 356, and this is amino acid 359, and et cetera. And it, so what we actually did is we tried to see that the measurement of S4, did it actually look like like a, a plunger, you know, it's like a, a, a sink where you have, you know, it, if there's a l real lot of water, it'll, the plunger will go down and it plunges. And then it, if you'd have just a little bit of water, you know, it, it, it has a tendency to go back up. So it goes back up and the water flows. Okay, so actually what we did is we tried to see, does it act like a simple plunger? And what we found was the answer was no, it didn't act like a simple plunger. In fact, it, it acted like sort of a rotary, more like a corkscrew. Somehow though, this corkscrew is bringing these plus charges, in one case over here, QV, which is practically zero, and then QV, where V is minus 0.1 volt. So it takes some plus charges and sort of brings it like that. Okay, and the last thing that, I guess two other things. One is actually you notice S between S5 and S6 is there's a very special region and that is that's where the pore is actually formed. So you can see over here between S5 and S6 it forms the pore which is where the ions can flow. So remember there are two types of positive charges that you have to worry about. What are the two types of positive charges? Sodium and potassium, actually that I'm going to argue is just is one, one type for now. That's on a current, that is, when the, there's sodium out here, a lot of it less, less here, it's flowing through, and when it's flowing through, it creates uh, a, a charge times a voltage. Okay, but we haven't talked about the positive charges on S4 and to a certain extent S2. These are positive ions that don't disappear. They're just always here, and their energy is a question of where are the positive charges in this background voltage. And that is called the gating charge, or the gating current. And they're totally different things. Okay, so now, so now you've gone through everything, except we want to understand the poor.
we want to understand how the ions flow through. Because apparently the switch is very sensitive to whether it's sodium or potassium flowing through, right? I mean, it must be, you know, if you set up that, again, zero millivolts outside and minus 60 or minus 100 millivolts inside, due to the, because of the difference in sodium, difference in potassium, and then when the, the channel opens, it, in this case, it allows sodium to flow through, and yet it does not allow potassium to flow through. So how can that be? So somehow this channel is different, differentiating between a sodium channel, uh, between a sodium ion and a potassium ion, and it's doing it fantastically well. It turns out when a sodium channel opens, it's something like 10,000 times more resistant to potassium than a, a sodium. You, have you guys ever measured what the radius of a sodium atom versus a potassium atom is? I haven't measured it either. Nevertheless, you know, they know. And the difference is, it is like an angstrom. It's unbelievable. And we're actually going to show in a second how it's so, so different. And we're going to calculate how it can be so different. And we're going to use the Boltzmann factor to see it. Okay, so this is, was done by my neme nemesis, Rod McKinnon, and it, which is one of the reasons he won and deserved the Nobel Prize. And what he did is he just for forgot about S1 through S S4, and he crystallized a protein from bacteria, which had just S5 and S6. And what happens is he found a structure that looked like this. This happens to be a potassium ion channel. We'll see that the sodium ion channel is actually very, very similar. It explains the ion selectivity, why K plus goes through and sodium doesn't go through. It also exp explains the rapid ion flux in terms of like it needs to, when it's open, it needs to allow the potassium to go through really fast, like at a million or 10 million <coughs> potassiums per second. In this case, we found excellent agreement between the FRET and crystallography. But of course, how these other guys move is, was not addressed. OK. So what he, does, he did is he did x-ray crystallography where he could determine every single atom. And what he did is it looks like this. You have the selectivity filter over here. That is, somehow it's differentiating between sodium and potassium. And in this case, remember, this is S6 and S5. And it, it forms a tetramer 
and it's right down the middle where this, this uh, potassium, in this case, can go. And it, let's just, in general, look over here. One, you have a fairly large water-filled cavity in the middle. And then you have the selectivity filter here. And this is really, it's amazing. It, it has four selectivity filters. It's to the point, these are the, the crystal structure without water. So let me, yeah. So this is another view of what it is. It comes in here. Here it's plenty of, plenty of water around. So the potassium, when the potassium is in solution in with water, what is the relationship between the water and the potassium? It turns out, t tell me what, what, hydrogen bonding, okay, what? Oxygen has a negative head. So this is negative, and that leaves a partial positive. So when it says sees a positive ion around, what does it do? Is there just one? Okay, so there's a whole bunch of them. In this case, commonly six of them. Okay. So if you want to dehydrate it to just get K plus, how much energy does it cost? It is. It turns out that it's incredibly expensive. It's really hard to make K plus not have any uh, waters bound to it. Turns out it costs about a, a hundred KT, where T is, you know, the temperature of the water. So what do you think if you have some water there, how much is, is here and how much is here? Is, how, do you, how do you determine what the difference is? Let's say I tell you that this is, let's say, zero, and this is an energy of 100 kT. So how would you calculate that Okay, good. good. Good talk about it for 30 seconds.
Monica, do you know? Is, is your is your name Monica? Oh, I'm sorry, sorry. I'm sorry, sorry. I didn't notice that you Okay. So, who has the answer? How much, if you have water around, how much of the potassium ion is hydrated versus dehydrated, given that this costs about 100 kT? Come on, everybody sh should know this. Come on. You'll, you'll really make my day if you volunteer and you're really not sure, but give it a try. No, you, you always volunteer. Uh, sorry. Uh, I shouldn't have done that. Sorry. Okay, go ahead. Sorry. Now you're making me look really bad because I, I, I love when he answers. Sorry. So somebody want to give me the answer? Tell me how. Yeah. You no. You're you're like him. You answered the question. You you commonly answer. I want to people who don't. Not to hell with it. <laughs> There's a Boltzmann factor. Boltzmann te tells you if you have an energy. Two energy states. E1 and energy t state E2, what is the relative populations? What is it? Over KT. Yeah, that's what I like. Yeah, let's hear from Boltzmann. Yeah. Man, just I'm trying to get you guys a little more awake. Anyways, as I was saying, so the difference, is, so if you have 100 kT, e to the minus 100 kT over kT, so that you have like e to the, you know, you, you have let's say one unit here, and you have e to the minus 100 here. This is basically zero, okay? So in this case, what they're doing is they're going to strip out the water molecules from the potassium over here, but they're going to make it practically zero costing zero energy. The way that they do this is they have the amino acids What's the structure of, a, of an amino acid? Come on. It, it, it had, what's that? Okay. Has 
and it has a carbon here. Okay, notice, in fact, if you have a K plus, that it has a bunch of heat water molecules, it can come and interact with this guy practically for free because you, this guy goes and instead it's actually will bond to the carboxylate of the amines. And in fact, notice, in fact, this is a potassium, and it, look, right over here, this is, truth is, I don't know whether this is C double bond or C O minus over here, but either one, one, two. And then there's also one and two, from the other one. So actually, what happens, instead of it being like 100 kT, it's essentially free. And then, it's essentially free over here on the outside. And here, it simply replaces the carboxylates of the amino acids from the water. And the fact that it can do it so freely tends to indicate, although it doesn't really prove it, it tends to indicate that, in fact, it can do this incredibly rapidly because there's not some big energetic barrier. In fact, it also, notice that there are four sites. Each one, when it has a potassium ion, is a plus charge. So there's a, a lot amount, you know, goes here, another one goes here, and the reason that another one will want to come in, and this guy will go out, is because it's all positive ions. So the fact that you have multiple sites is good. Yes, Pen. But, but when it, it, it isn't. It, over here, it's so water filled cavity. It, it, that is, there's water around. Therefore, the sodium, the potassium has a bunch of water molecules with it, right? And it, then it comes and interacts with this first set of, in, in this case here, the first set of am amino acids and it, it has this, the carboxylates here. And what it does is, well, it can energetically, with no, no penalty at all, it can, it will be in an equilibrium between the water free and, in fact, it'll interact with the carboxylate. That's right. That's right. There's an e equilibration. The equilibration is incredibly fast. This is just a simple water molecule. But yes. Yes. Why is it necessary to get a lot of water? Ah. You have to have some means to, to allow it to differentiate for example, a potassium ion from a sodium ion. So in fact, 
what we've done is for potassium ion. What, in fact, is the situation for sodium? What, what happens when a sodium ion approaches this? That this is, again, for potassium. So, in fact, for potassium, it, it will essentially look like a, a, a free ride. So sodium, what about sodium? It, is sodium like this? Is it primarily hydrogen bonded versus, versus no? The energetics is very similar. What's the difference between sodium and, and a potassium? Yes. Sodium is small. <coughs> so what does that mean? Yeah. Yes? That's right. The sodium is just a little bit smaller, amazingly enough, such that in order for it to exchange the water here for the amino acid, it isn't quite right. And in fact, in that way, it's like about 10,000-fold more selective for sodium than for potassium. 10,000-fold, that's pretty good. Wait, 10,000-fold. So how do I get that? Okay, uh, I want you to calculate for me. See, I want you to calculate for me. What it meant, how you can get 10,000-fold selectivity. Okay, go ahead. Wow, you're fast. You get what? That's right. That's right. Yes. Only nine. Yeah. Nine KT. And it gives it 10,000 fold difference. Yeah, so either the minus nine a lot. Right. Okay. So So what what is the, the difference at, between this state and this state <coughs> to get 10,000 fold? Who who is a calculator? Yeah, I know. Okay, go ahead. That 9 kT difference between this and this, or be true. or in this case, it, it, between this for potassium and for sodium, nine kT, which it, it is not that much of a difference. Nine kT, it's like three hydrogen bonds, you know, sort of thing. But it it makes a tremendous <coughs> difference. Yes. How did I get it? Okay. How, how did I get it? Um, so he said that there, it was like 10,000 times more, or 10,000 10, times likely or something like that. So you just do LMS 10,000. Um, so it's e, e to the minus 10,000, e to the minus that number has to equal uh, whatever 10,000. 10, yeah. 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 
I, 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 yeah, I, I tell you this. Hey, what counts is I tell you it. <laughs> You're laughing. So, okay, how, how would you measure it? You just stick a whole bunch of ions across this gradient and count how many sodium ions go through a potassium channel. And yeah. it's one per 10,000 potassium. Are you measuring the inside and the outside? Yeah. And the same was done for a person? Uh -huh. That's right. And then what you have is the professor gets up in front of the class and says, it's 10,000. No, that, very good question. OK, so we've now gone and basically we sort of understand everything about the ion channel. The, there is an aqueous ca cavity that there is no energetic barrier going from the water to basically a low dielectric media. The dehydrated <coughs> potassium is bound to eight oxygen atoms formed from the carbonyl CO double bond O of amino acids from the selectivity. That is, there is no energetic barrier to dehydration for K plus, where there's a large cost for ions such as Na plus, which is slightly smaller, and hydration is slightly bigger. Third, the multiple ions can be in cavity at the same time, so you can get a very high throughput. Turns out it's 10 to the eighth ions per second. And effectively, you get what is diffusion-limited passive transport of K plus while acting like basically a brick wall to sodium. And so it, oh, so the, this is just what you calculated, 9.kt, 9.2. <coughs> and in fact, so if you, crystallize the sodium channel, what you should get is ju it's just right for the sodium ion to get through and just wrong for the potassium. So what did scientists do? They crystallized it. This, in fact, is the shaker potassium channel. It happens to be four identical subunits, S1 and S6. The sodium, sodium channel is incredibly similar, though, as you ma might imagine, it has slight differences. That difference accounts for the relative selectivity. OK. Um, to show you that I'm not a completely bad guy. We are going on break. What in three minutes. And then we have a little bit more in terms of showing how we get the sodium potassium gradient to start out with. Three minutes.
You guys are just amazing to me. And you just will sit. I guess so. I mean, after an hour, I like I need to sort of get up and. No, you look you're looking at me like oh, you're crazy, man. <laughs> oh, is it clear? I couldn't understand what happened to the previous one. Why was the I couldn't understand why the that minus the attention of the council now. Is it clear? <laughs> This class or some other class? No, for this class. Good. I like, I like how tech now is everything's in my head. It's weird as hell. I'm like looking over at him, like, holy shit, I need to do that. It's like, uh, I, th I think that. That, that that's kind of good that you can interact more rather than you know trying to copy down everything but it, it's I your that's my way of learning better, yeah so. oh well, if that's your way of learning then you should be writing down no we're not writing down it's oh yes uh, please, uh, are these six subunits of the single protein is it like ah. uh, it, it, <laughs> okay <laughs> okay. <coughs> so the question is, uh, uh, are these six, uh, these six transmembrane domains, uh, is this, in the potassium channel, it turns out that it's four separate protein Proteins, period. It looks there, 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 and there. They're separate. In the case of this potat sorry, sodium channel, it turns out they're, they're not. In fact, it's one protein, it's super large. It, it undergoes you know, six time, transmembrane, and then it does it again, and then does it again, and does it again. And they are, in sodium also they are uh, like stacked like the potassium, they make like a square. Yeah, absolutely. It, every, everything else is basically identical. And in fact, there are a, a series of there's not just one sodium channel, but there are, you know, there are s several different sodium channels. In fact, one that might be, uh, have fast in inactivation, one ha generally has slow inactivation, and that depends on, you know, whether it's in your heart or your brain and that sort of thing. The, the, this is a way to get you really smart, you know, you, Take your sodium channels in your brain, you put a little tweak on them, and then you know you're a lot smarter. So I I recommend that you do that before the final. Sodium injection. <laughs> sodium injection, yeah. If anyone didn't get it, I wasn't serious. Okay, so. Okay. Josh, can I have the lights? Okay, and now the question is, how do your cells develop this gradient? Because to start with, there's a lot of sodium on the inside, very little sodium, a lot of sodium on the outside, little sodium inside, and potassium, little on the, outside and a lot 
on the inside. And, and what, what we're going to do is, is talk about it in general, that there is something called the sodium-potassium ATPase. So the fact that it's an ATPase gives you a clue in terms of that it uses ATP. And what it does is it uses up a ATP and takes that energy and undergoes a, com a protein for, to a, for a conformational change, which then results on three potassiums going out and one so uh, two. Did I screw up? Okay. Just shoot me. So whatever I said, ignore. And so listen to me now. So the ATP gets hydrolyzed. It takes three sodiums, right? Pumps it out and takes two potassiums and pumps it in. Yeah, OK, good. And so basically, it uses ATP to pump or exchange sodium from the outside and potassium from, from the inside. And we're not going to go through at all the details, but it, this is what it looks like. It, ATP, you know, th th basically it amounts to, it, it, here's the outside, or here's the outside and here's the inside. So it, it opens up, some sodium goes over here, does its phosphorylates, the ATP, or dephosphorylates the ATP into ADP, and it undergoes a conformational change, which basically allows the three sodium on the outside to, to now be taken inside. It goes, and then essentially it does the <coughs> opposite over here for potassium. OK? And amazingly enough, this process can account for as much as 60% of total ATP consumption. Because as you can imagine, you have to, you have a lot of sodium or a lot of potassiums and a lot of thinking to do. OK? So this is amazing. I, I, can't, I can't believe it. It must be the end of the semester or something. Anyways. Don't, don't anyone complain that I ran too long in general, because this is the one, one exception. Oh, and that reminds me, you've gotten the, what, I, ISIS forms? Is that? Yeah, that's it, ISIS. This is amazing. ISIS. ISIS. Uh, ISIS. Uh, so uh, I realize that you have a lot of things to do. In fact, actually, you have the homeworks, which you should do it. Um, but in addition to doing that, you really should fill out your ISIS forms. And in it, if you would, for example, give me what you like best about 
the course and what you didn't like so well about the course. And see, the, this is great. Uh, I have you captured while you're doing this evaluation so I can like drive it into you and you have to listen. And one thing that I'm actually curious about is the homeworks, whether they were helpful or or too much or too little. One thing that I'm considering doing is making the homeworks a higher percentage of your grade in the future because it seems like a lot of your energy goes to, towards doing them and whether you think that's a good idea or not. 